Okay, welcome everyone to the Investing with IBD podcast. I'll be your host today. My name is Scott St. Clair. I am the manager of the Premium Product Group here at Investors Business Daily. I'm sitting in for Justin Nielsen, who is on vacation again. It seems like he's been on vacation a lot, and he's in Italy this time. He must be handling the market really, really well, Arusha. <laughs> My guest, as always, is Arusha Pires. He's a portfolio manager at O'Neill Global Advisors. How's it going, Arusha? Hey, it's, it's great to have the one and only Scott St. Clair <laughs> as host of the IBD, Investing with IBD podcast here. And Justin, I hope you are enjoying your vacation, but don't stay away too long. Yeah, I know. Well, it'll depend on how well I do. I wonder if you'll listen to this like on the uh, plane ride home or something. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, today's guest is stock market historian, author John Boyk. So John is with us. He's the author of How Legendary Traders Have Made Millions in the Market. Uh, I have three of the four books that I know he has written. I haven't, I haven't got around to the new one just yet. As you can see, I'm kind of a stock market book junkie, so this is a this is a perfect guest for me. Thank you, John. Welcome to the show. Well, thanks for having me. It's great to be here, guys. I appreciate it. Thank you. So today's podcast, we'll talk about the current market, and then we will talk a lot mm -hmm. about history. What can history teach us? Some of the great traders previously, uh, how they used history to uh, prepare themselves for the current market. And then we'll wrap up with some stocks that uh, John has on his radar. So uh, let's jump right into it. Let's go with the uh, the current market. Uh, Arusha, why don't you start? Give us a little, uh, your two cents on the market. And then I'd love to hear uh, what John has to say. Yeah. So Scott, yeah, we'll, we'll, we're, we are still in a confirmed uptrend here. Uh, but the the market, and I have the Nasdaq up here. The market has been extended. It's been it's been a very powerful rally over the last month, and so having some type of pullback, either to uh, the ten day moving average or even the twenty one day moving average, is is completely normal here. Uh, and honestly, even though it's tough when these pullbacks happen, it's probably the healthiest thing for the market. So overall, the markets are still hanging in there. I want to say three distribution days uh, on the NASDAQ right now, uh, but uh, things are good. You just want to be careful of buying extended. Uh, agreed. Yeah, it's it's we're in that spot where, you know, things are almost too good and you, you get a little nervous, you know, especially in the last few years is right when things have gotten good, the market right. would would stop being good. So it's it's uh, we're never satisfied as traders. I always you know, I was if if we're doing well, we're afraid it's going to stop doing well. And if we're doing poorly, we're afraid it's going to go on forever. Right. So exactly. <laughs> it's a, it makes it tough. John, let, let's uh, let's hear your thoughts on the current market environment. OK, thanks. Um, so, Arucha, I want to mention this first. We got to stop meeting on the days the Fed speaks. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. We, we did the podcast on November 2nd, six and a half months ago. That's the day the Fed raised the rates for the sixth time. That three wow. quarter. Remember that the, the the market just took a dive after that. <laughs> and here we are today. The Fed's be oh, oh we're going to do more more uh, rate uh, increases, and here we go again. But um, anyway, so to relate back, I I want to take two minutes on that too. So back in November, remember we were talking about the the market was in a bear market for almost a year then, and the moving averages were stacked upside down. You had the two hundred up here, the fifty below it, the twenty one, and the ten. And new lows were exceeding new highs on a daily basis. So here we are seven and a half months later. What a change, right? So yeah. we have the moving averages are stacked properly. We talked about that back in November. The healthy markets have the 200 down here, the 50 above that, the 21, and then the 10. And that's what we have. The only one that's a little diverted is the Dow because the 21 and the 50 are kind of right on each other. But the leading NASDAQ is is healthy in those lines. We have new highs exceeding new lows. We've done, we've had 12 days in a row. Not sure what today looks like. That might kick it back one day. But uh, last week we had 1,200, using the IBD numbers, which I use, 1,200 new highs exceeding new lows for the whole week. That was the strongest in 83 weeks. Wow. Okay. So you had to the first week of November in 2021 to get that that strength there. So we've had 60% of the days this year, new highs are exceeding new lows. I use that as a gauge to, 
to determine the health or strength of a market uptrend or a downtrend. We had January, February, nice, strong new highs over new lows when we came out of the year, started the year off with that. And then we went to um, we went to that choppy market in March, April and May. And you had new highs trading off with new lows almost every day. And so far in June, we've only had one negative day. So I look at those along with everything you said, um, Arusha, that, you know, we are and IBD nails it on May 10th when you brought it back to a confirmed uptrend. Every single time, every single day after that has been a pretty strong day. Yes, this is the pullback. You know, everybody's been talking about this. So we'll see how it acts. Um, so far, it's been it's been pretty normal. And there's more when the when it first started this uptrend, it was pretty narrow. And now it's um, expanded to several other. Le I mean, even airlines and cruise lines have, mm -hmm. have jumped into the mix. So it's not just tech. There's some other uh, things happening. So it is um, a complete opposite of what we talked about back in November. So this is how they look. And we talked about that. Um, how do cycles work? And you, you're up above these lines now, new highs exceeding new lows. The breath is expanding. Pullbacks are normal. So we'll see what happens. You know, the Fed could ruin the party again. You know, it's what they typically have done in the past. So. That's true. Hey, and Scott, John, what, what are your thoughts, actually? Let, let, let's get your thoughts, even though you are the, the, the host of the show. Yeah, I, I, I'm, you know, for me, I'm a little bit uh, more of a shorter term trader. So I've, you know, the market, not that it has to go down, it just doesn't look like a great spot to definitely be putting more on. Mm -hmm. So in the last few days, I've been trimming the trees, so to speak, get down to the stuff that I really want to try to hold on to. And in all the ancillary stuff has has been you know cut or just pushed out. So I'm I'm just down to a small number of names uh, that uh, you know I'm not very good at holding through potential pullbacks, but I'm, I'm going to try. I keep trying. So I have a small number of names, and I'm actually short the Nasdaq index okay. as you know. I, I don't know if you want to call it a hedge, but it. it it, it, it will help me sit through the pullbacks and the NVIDIAs of the world, so to speak, um, hopefully. Uh, I, now, Yo. if I'm right about the market going down, then NVIDIA is going to go down more than the market, uh, you know, because of the, the way it acts, the way the type of stock it is. But it's, <laughs> I feel like the market's a little stretched here and, and um, a, trimming the tree would be the best uh, way to put it for me. Um, and... And John, you mentioned one thing that is funny because I wanted to ask you as a student of history, two things. So early on, everyone was didn't like the market because it was so narrow. And then what did the market do? It, it rallied and rallied. And all of a sudden, it felt like the breadth just expanded and exploded in this small, small window. So it, it kind of fooled uh, people, I think. And then the other thing that bothers people is the outperformance of the NASDAQ versus the Dow, the S&P and the Russell. You know, it's a chasm between between them. So, you know, have you ever seen anything like that uh, historically? And, and what what might that uh, portend to tell you? I've seen that a lot um, through history. It's it's filled with examples like that. Really, the NASDAQ and the Dow are trading places from last year <clears throat> where the Dow was the leader. The NASDAQ took some hard hits. <clears throat> Typically, that was for uh, the reason that I could see for that was the high interest rate environment that the Fed was you know, pumping the brakes real hard. High interest rates affect tech companies a lot more than than the uh, stocks on the on the New York Stock Exchange or w what's in the Dow, if you want to call that so. That's typical. They've traded places before in in where where one leads at one point, and then I think the market was anticipating you know the pause, and maybe this is the end of the rate increases, and that's why I think when you when you saw this come out, the Nasdaq, you had very narrow leadership, but the first ones out in an uptrend are typically the strongest ones. So, and you're seeing that this. First one's out really this year, if you want to go back to January, when it kind of started and then kind of kicked back a little bit. You had NVIDIA and you had Tesla and, and some of those which are still strong. And 
super micro when we get to the stocks, another one. So typically the first ones out will be the strongest ones as, a, as the uptrend gains more speed or gains more traction, you're going to have more breath coming into it. And whatever the, um, the theme is or whatever, it, you're going to see stocks that kind of relate to that theme. And the theme so far this year has been AI. So there's a big push around that. When we get to the history side, I'm going to give you a great example of something that looked really like this about 30 years ago. So AI was, was you know, we're thinking this is the next big thing. So if that's the case and this continues, the traction continues, you're going to have a lot more stock come out as this market broadens out. So and if the Fed, there's still these two big overhangs. This is the thing. You still have inflation worries still above normal, and you still have the Fed not quite sure what to do. I mean, not quite sure which way we, we're going. As I said, we're going to we'll pause to reevaluate the situation. So it's kind of like I call the Fed. The Fed to me is like taking um uh, I mean, it, it's just they don't know yet. So there's still some uncertainty and overhangs to the market. And I think that's that could cause this to delay or maybe chop along a, bit, a little bit more. We don't know. So we'll see. But right now, I think that's everything that's taken this market up right now is we thought they'd pause. We thought there might be one, maybe two more. And that's it. AI is like the big new thing. Is that where everything's going? So I think that's you're seeing that in some of the stocks and some of the, the indexes. That's what they're doing. Okay, great. All right. So it, I think a couple of things that I've taken from this for sure is, one, you got to be ready. You got to be prepared because uh, the NVIDIAs, the super micros of the world, they don't wait for uh, clear blue skies before they start going. You know, there's uh, there's always a little bit of uncertainty. And ideally, there should be. Uh, when these leaders break out. So you, you have to be ready and you have to be willing to to put on some risk if you want to capture those best names. The market's gotten a little bit uh, broader, which is good, but you know we're kind of in no man's land. And then the, the last but not least is the Fed wild card, which look, you, uh, nobody knows, right? Uh, the Fed doesn't know. Stanley Druckenmiller, who will, maybe we, you can talk about later, he doesn't know. And, you know, that's just uh, the nature of the beast uh, when you're investing in markets. So uh, when we come back, we'll discuss some key learning lessons, things you can do based on history that John has studied for years and years to help prepare you for whether this is a, a big bull market or whether it's uh, you're looking for the next leg up. The Direction Hydrogen ETF offers exposure to the top 30 pure play hydrogen economy companies by largest market capitalization, leading the way towards net zero emissions by providing more accessible, efficient, sustainable solutions across five hydrogen related sub themes. With clean hydrogen based energy expected to grow five times in the next 30 years, companies building hydrogen related businesses to generate power, heating, transportation, and more will likely thrive. Okay, welcome back to the Investing with IBD podcast. I'm your host again, Scott St. Clair, filling in for Justin Nielsen. Uh, we've got Arusha Pierce with us. He's a portfolio manager with O'Neill Global Advisors. And our special guest is uh, John Boyk. So John, let's get into some history lessons, some things that you've learned from speaking and, and uh, studying uh, some of the greatest traders that we all uh, admire and and, and love to read about uh, throughout history. So the greatest traders, O'Neill was the best ever, in my opinion. He was a historical analysis master. He was, I called him the chairman of historical research. No one did better than he did. Um, but he also wasn't the first. The, the mentors before him, Gerald Loeb and Jesse Livermore and even Richard Wyckoff, they all studied history. They all understood market cycles before them and how they repeat themselves. They all studied the best stocks in every major uptrend. So they looked at what the characteristics were. So they all did that. O'Neill did that all the time. So, you know, looking at the market today, there's a couple um, scenarios in the past that look similar to this. They're never going to be exact, of course, because there's always different uh, issues going on. But and here's how O'Neill did this, too. This is this is good lessons, I think. So in 1979 and 80, 
1980, you had a nice uptrend. You still had high inflation. You had high interest rates. Same thing we have today. And then in June of 81, you get the market starts topping. Oil and, and oil and gas stocks did really well there. O'Neill did really well with those in 1980 and 1979. But in mid-June, you start having topping signals. The leaders start falling through break, uh, moving averages on big volume. The market's pulling back, distributions all over the place. And you have this um, downtrend, which starts in June of 81. But what happened then is the price of oil starts to fall, but the Fed is determined to slam inflation down. So they're pumping the brakes, raising interest rates very fast. And that's when O'Neill puts out a full page ad in the Wall Street Journal in February 82. He sees this and he's watching this and he says, inflation's back is now broken because the Fed's been pumping the brakes. Oil and gas is coming down. And he said, get ready for the next upturn because the economy was still OK. It wasn't imploding. So the market pulls back for several more months. But in August of 82, the market finds a bottom and starts to take off. So he was almost perfectly right on that. But what happened in 82, in August 82, all these new leaders come out. So you, you and there was a slew of them. There was Dress Barn. There was the Limited. There was uh, Commodore. There was Walmart. There was Home Depot. There were all these new leading stocks coming out in August of 82. And O'Neill jumps into those. Pick and Save was still ripping. Uh, price company was one he got in a little earlier there. So that, but what happened was the Fed stopped raising rates. And then the market had kind of an, uns the uncertainty was kind of gone. And then the market, so inflation's coming down. So the Fed did its job. They stopped raising rates. GDP starts rising again. And you have this whole new bull market. 83 was a super year in the market for that. So that's one example that's similar to what we have today. The better one, though, I think, is 94 and 95. So in November of 1993, the NASDAQ starts to peak and O'Neill um, sends out an institutional letter through the O'Neill companies and says, we're seeing distribution here. He's selling his stocks. He went to 100 percent cash, cash position and, he, and the market starts pulling back. It, especially especially the Nasdaq. The Nasdaq was hit harder than the Dow. The Dow actually rose from December to January into 94, but the Nasdaq pulled back and now you have this sloppy, choppy market. But what happened there was the Fed started raising interest rates. They were concerned about inflation's rising again. The Fed started raising interest rates in February of 94. They raised rates seven times in a row. OK, mm -hmm. so yeah. similar, right? OK, it so is very similar. Powell, congratulations. You broke your record. We're at <laughs> <laughs> so seven interest rate increases in a row. What does the market do? Pulls back hard every single time it raises rates. In in December of 1994, Orange County, California, announces a one point six billion dollar hit to its derivatives portfolio because it didn't manage the increase. The interest rate increases properly. And John, that was back yeah. when 1.6 billion was a lot of money. Yes, uh. <laughs> that was a lot of money. It's still a lot of money, but look how similar that is. We had Silicon Valley Bank, we had Signature Bank. They didn't manage their portfolios property with rising long-term interest rates. So yeah. the same thing happened. Orange County, California, then files bankruptcy in 1995. It's the biggest municipality to, to go bankrupt in history. So, but it was confined. But what happened then was in January 95, the Fed raises rates one more time. That was the seventh time. But then they stopped and they said this, we have pulled inflation down. We've stopped. In February and March of 95, the market starts to take off. Mark Minervini is watching this and he sees two stocks, FSI International takes out in February and Kenneth Cole starts taking off in March. He gets into both of those stocks. They both went up over 100% in seven and eight months. But those weren't the only ones. You had Ascend Communications. You had AccuStat. You had 
um, Alliance Semiconductor. You had, um, uh, who's the other ones? Uh, Gartner, you had, you had Cisco break out again. So you had all these tech stocks coming out. And a lot of these stocks, Ascend Communications went up tenfold in just yep. over a year. I mean, yep. that thing was, it's a, almost a straight line to the top. But what happened in the summer of 95, so the Fed's done, the market starts taking off, big traders are coming in, O'Neill's coming in, he buys, um, he's, he's in all these, he's in Franklin Resources at the time, and just, he's, he's hitting all these. But what happened in the summer of 95, Netscape comes out as an IPO. Mm -hmm. Guess what the talk and the buzz was about in mid-95? This thing called the internet. Right. Is this, is this going to be the next big thing? I mean, the young people today, they can't believe this, but I was, you know, back then, we didn't even know what the internet was. So yeah, that, well, I remember, John, using 95, using Netscape, and you, ch checking out some of those web pages of it seemed kind of cool, but it's, it, it was like, okay, maybe I'll check it, I don't know, once every few days, yeah. you know, or once a week, right? right? You, it's not like, you couldn't imagine that you'd be tied to your computer. So, but look what happened though. So Netscape comes public in, I think it was June 95, June or July. And the market starts taking off. The market was up 45%. The Nasdaq was up 45% in eight months. Then 96 and 97, you had some pullbacks, but the market is ripping. And that's when Jim Ropel really got his act together in 96 and 97. He makes his first triple digit years and he's he's in the, some of these monster stocks that do this so that scenario looks similar but what what happened there though so o'neill in both of those situations that i told you about mm -hmm. he cashes out when he sees the top coming so he's in cash but he's watching it all the time and he's watching these things and then when it comes up and confirms the uptrends and i mean he called it back in the day almost perfectly and he's loading into these major leaders and there was nobody better than him that met, that hit the major leader of every single major uptrend from 1960 to you know the last few so there's nobody better than than him that did that mm -hmm. so that's what the if that's and and he wasn't the only one Gerald Loeb did this in the 1920s through the 1970s wow Gerald Wyckoff did it I mean Richard Wyckoff did it in from 1900 to the 1930s. Livermore did it. Bernard Baruch did it. Um, this Darvis did it in the 50s. And then a lot of people don't know this about him. He was active in the seven in the 73, 74 bear market. He sat the whole thing out. <clears throat> he wow. kept coming in, took small losses. And then in 75, when the market starts tearing up, he jumped into four or five. He had Tandy. He had National Semiconductor. He had Moore McCormick. He had Houston Oil. Scored triple digit gains on all those. Using the same strategy he did in 1958-59 when he made the $2 million in 18 months. That's it's incredible. the same thing. It happens over and over again. Stan Weinstein stage analysis. Stage one, stage two, stage three, stage four. And we're doing the same thing. If you go back to... 2020, the bear market, the COVID bear market, then you rip off of that from April through, you know, every week. Every, so many traders had triple digit years in 2020. And I've said this many times. I did too. If I can do it, anybody can do it. So <laughs> that was a great year. And then 2021, you had this choppy uptrend, but Minervini nails a 330% profit for the uh, return for the year shortening up his time frame, Scott, like maybe what you're talking about. He shortened up his time frames because breakouts weren't working in the same manner as they did in 2020. So, but this cycle repeats. And then in November 21, you get the peak of the NASDAQ. It's foreseeing the Fed is going to raise rates. Inflation's too high. And then you had this bear market down to 2020. And now you've got some improvement for this year. So we'll see if it <laughs> you know, moving moving averages, new highs, new lows, they can all, you know, focus you in on how well, how will this run? Will this continue? Will it break? Well, the market will tell you that. Yeah.
These leading stocks, if they start breaking down big moving averages, the 21 day, the 50 day on big volume, you know, the market's coming down. So, yeah, well, John, you, you know, I think what's really interesting uh, about this is that 95 scenario that you, you talked about how it was semiconductors were, were really go, doing well there because of the Internet. Right. <clears throat> and you're seeing that same kind of parallel uh, this time around too. AI and here are the semiconductors or a number of the companies that are benefiting from uh, this theme going on right now. I mean, Scott, Scott and I would hear when we were both at MarketSmith and, and in the office every day, we would hear a, a, stories about the 95 market. And I mean, oh, they yeah. were still talking about yeah. it, you know, 15 yeah. years later, how strong that market. And it was the year of the semiconductor and stuff like that. And so it is kind of eerie and almost deja vu just now seeing these semiconductors and a kind of a whole new kind of technology coming out. And, may, you know, maybe this is a brand new catalyst. Well, if you look at those from the mid 90s to the end of to like March 2000, mm -hmm. you had you had a 98 sharp re, um, correction there. You had some issues that caused those, but they were pretty short lived. That was an incredible, unprecedented opportunities there, windows of opportunities. I know, you know, O'Neill in 99 and 2000, I mean, 98, 99, I think he had his two best years ever. He was up over 300 and 400% in those mm -hmm. years. So the point is, that was the internet building out, and inflation was contained, interest rates were contained. And if we can get inflation and interest rates to be contained, and if AI is the next new one, for everybody who thinks you missed NVIDIA and I lost everything, I, I missed the whole AI thing, it's not. I mean, th if that rolls out to what it can be and the benefits from it, from what I've seen in some of the reports I've read, they could be bigger than the Internet. So there's always going to be those opportunities and it's fun. It is kind of interesting how it sets up, but there's so many of those in history. So um, there's, there's been 35 major uptrends since 1900 major uptrends. I call where the market's up at least 35 to 40% in at least four to five months. The average was 14 months and it went up 74%. Wow. So and this happens it, it's going to happen again. Okay. Are we at the beginning of it? We'll see. Nobody knows, but back to Scott, you mentioned, so Stan Drunkenmiller. So I saw an uh, interview of him about a month or so ago where he's saying, um, yeah, I'm, I'm checking all my history because I'm looking back, trying to relate what what's happening here. I see a little bit of this, a little bit of that. All the best traders in history from all my study added historical analysis to their toolkit. They were, yes, they had the fundamental analysis down. They had the uh, technical analysis down. They had the psychological analysis down. But there was one other piece that you don't hear about a lot that was common to every single one of the elite traders of all time. And that was their knowledge and their use of precedences from history. From the traders before them, from the best stocks, from prior periods that looked similar, and from the cycles that the market was going through. They all repeat. They're not going to be exact, but there's so many similarities. And that kept those greatest traders, it kept them selling into strength or climax runs when they saw the market kind of top out. And then you can see the top. We saw the top in November 21. It was classic. And then cuts moving average lines on bigger volume, and it it rallies up. Look at 2022; those bear market rallies, all of them banged up right into the 200-day and got rejected. That's classic bear market rally stuff. It's happened every single downtrend. There's been 23 major downtrends since 1900, 23, and there's been 33 major uptrends, and they all acted similar. The length of time will vary, but um, they that's that's how it works. And the best traders knew that. They studied this. O'Neill was the best ever, no doubt about it. So well the, um, the magnitude of the down moves is always, at least so far historically, like you mentioned, 
more than overwhelmed by the the up move. So it's yeah. it's such a great risk reward. It's such a great trade off, and a lot of people are afraid or they're or they're worried about bear markets and. And you really should embrace, you know, me and Arusha did a webinar with Scott O'Neill. We called it uh, Market Smith's Love Corrections, right? Because you really should embrace corrections, bear markets, whatever you want to call it, because they set this, they sow the seeds for, you know, the 36th major uptrend and the 37th and the 38th. Yeah. And they're all out there and you just have to uh, be prepared and, and study the history like you mentioned. That's so true. And the other thing about it is they all look similar. So when the stocks that are going to lead the next uptrend, which ones are they? They're typically the ones that resist the downtrend the most. So they're the RS leaders. And they're going to be on the cutting edge of whatever. So, you know, in the 1900s, 1910, whatever, the railroads were leading because that was where everything, all the investments were going. Then you had in the 20s and 30s, you had the automobiles. In the 50s, you had consumer stocks after the war was over and you had all this retail coming in, credit cards finally coming out, the introduction of all that. The consumer was the king back then. <clears throat> in the 70s, you had oil and gas leading of some of those uptrends. And then you had computers in the late 80s and 90s, computers. Then you had the Internet. Then you had social media in 2000s. And now we're talking about maybe AI is it. I think the market needs a new cap, a new driving force. Yeah. And AI, and like EV vehicles, they're not going away. So AI could be it. I mean, this could be it. And if it isn't, you, that's what this, you know, based on our philosophy, that's what the stop loss is for. So the asymmetry of AI, AI stocks is very, very appealing to me because of, you know, the, the, you, if you're right, you might make 50, 60, 90, a hundred percent or more. Some people might be able to hold on to these stocks better than me. And if you're wrong, you might lose three, four, five, six percent, or or something like that. So you risk a little to make a lot. You want you just do that over and over, rinse and repeat, uh, and you stay in the game. You survive. That's how uh, a lot of the guys, obviously with Bill O'Neill, but a lot of people that came through the portfolio management side at, at O'Neill did so well. Just kind of that same process. They just were rinsing and repeating the process that bill was doing for years and years and years um yeah and Scott, ahead, we'll do, and just very quickly it, it's it's amazing because if you look like only six seven months ago you know the markets were really struggling as, as john was talking about and there wasn't really a catalyst out there <laughs> yeah. uh, and it almost changed right when they i mean everything kind of changed once they introduced chat gpt and everyone started playing with it and you know, it was a, a, more people tried it than anything else, you know, in such a short amount of time. And, yeah. and that's where also like here's potentially that new catalyst. Um, so the markets can change sometimes uh, almost instantly. Uh, and so that's why you just have to never you don't want to ever drift too far away from the market because uh, they can they can take off on a dime as, as we've seen over the last uh, four or five weeks. Yeah, the AI and, talk really started the beginning of this year. So yeah, <clears throat> you know. And and John, you you mentioned something. There's two things that I'm super curious about in your studies, like Mark and Jim Ropel and William O'Neill. And I think I have the answer, but I, I'm I know that you've kind of dug into the weeds with them. But you mentioned stock selection. I, I think we have a really good idea about how they choose their stocks. You mentioned the first one's new high, relative strength, and you know, Bill has talked about it a million times, the books on how he picks stocks, but I'm super curious about uh, <clears throat> position sizing. Like, you know, the, these weren't one, you know, Jim Ropel didn't have 1% of, of um, you know, ALSC or, and Scott O'Neill, who one of his best winners was Dress Barn, a stock that you mentioned. He didn't have a 2% position um, in that. So obviously without giving away any of the secret sauce on the sides of their accounts and stuff, but did you, did you notice anything as far as like position sizing that, that was, um, unique to, uh, to them? Uh, in other words, Mark and Jim and, and Bill, et cetera, they, they all did kind of the same thing as far as the, uh, concentration, having a, a, 
a certain size position that can make a difference if you get it right is what I'm trying to say. Well, all the best traders did the same thing. <clears throat> they concentrated <clears throat> on the leaders of whatever uptrend they were participating in. And what they do is they let the stocks lead them in. And so they're always watching for that. But it goes back even before them. Nicholas Darvis had 50% of his account in Texas Instruments in 1959. And he had a multi-million dollar account then. So when you have conviction like that, I mean, O'Neill did that so many times. He did that with eBay. He did that with Amgen. He's, he's, he's done that so many times where almost his whole account is like in one stock. I mean, that tr takes tremendous conviction. And Ropel does that too. When he was, uh, Broadcom was his first big leader. He was big into that stock. You know, I think he had 50% of his account in that stock. So Minervini takes big positions too. So when you, I love this Stan Druckenmiller quote. He says, when you have tremendous conviction, go for the jugular. So, and I know he said it, he's in NVIDIA big time right now. So that's how the, the big money is made in the market by having conviction and concentration in the leaders of the day, whatever that uptrend is leading. So every uptrend has produced all these major monster stocks that went up hundreds, a thousand percent or more. And some did it in a very short period of time. The average monster stock, which I call monster stock is a stock to me that doubles in 12 months. The average is between six and 12 months. So it's not a long time. Look how many, I said this before, um, in Monster Stock Lessons, I showed 29 Monster Stocks just from April through December of 2020. 29 of them all went up over 100%. And they had to trade at least a million shares a day. So these were the liquid leaders. It was Zoom. It was DocuSign. It was Tesla. It was Neo. All of those. And some of them went up five, six hundred hundred percent. So the best traders, and this goes back to Livermore. This goes back to Wyckoff. Gerald Loeb in the night, in the mid to late twenties had most of his account in Montgomery Ward. He made over $2 million in that one stock back in 1924. Okay. So conviction when you're right. And how do you know you're right? There you go. That's the key is, is it's not a 50% position. Like I've done all my research on Broadcom. This looks super good. Let's put half of our account in there. No, That's not right. how it's done, right? It leads, it leads you in. And and it's it's not easy. It's hard. What did O'Neill say? Only one or two of the stocks you ever buy are going to be super winners. Yeah. So how did he have the winner. neck? Yep. How did he have the knack to get every single one in every major uptrend? He used precedences from history. He watched um, price and volume action. He studied the fundamentals. He wanted the leader of the day. So the leader right now, sorry, is NVIDIA right now. It might not last, but it it might. And I know Drunken Miller's in there. I know Ropel's in there big and they're in there big. So we'll see what happens, but it's having conviction. How do you know you're right? If that was your question, you know, you're right because the, the, the stock is going to follow every single monster stock template since the beginning of time. Okay. Since the beginning of charts back in the 1888s. Okay. They're going to ride up on positive price and volume action. They'll pull back on lower volume, they'll ride key moving averages, the 50 day or the 21 day. And they that's what they're gonna do. And if the market is in an uptrend and new highs are exceeding new lows and it's it's broadening out, you're still gonna have those big leaders. They become big leaders, why? Because the greatest traders are piling into them and they're gonna ride them up. And then they're, what they're gonna do is what happens is the typical trader won't notice it till way later. And the, the big traders will sell it into strength. And the other traders are going to be caught in the downtrend. So it's, you got to think 
in a contrary kind of point of view there. So when do these traders get in? They get in early when the market starts to turn. They get in when most people are scared. And then they yeah. get out when everybody's happy. Exactly. So. When it feels good. Yeah. <laughs> All so, right. Well, th thank you, John. Let's 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 let that lead into obviously one of the tickers we will mention uh, that you'll talk about. No surprise in video. But um, so history is a great learning lesson. Uh, you should be studying history. It, the market, I think, as Mark Twain said, uh, history doesn't repeat, but it rhymes. Right. And so a lot of these tickers that John mentioned, they come back is just different tickers, right? They, they, the charts look the same and and, and O'Neill and Ropel was great at identifying, oh, that looks a lot like XYZ, which was a, a big winner from 1967, et cetera. So um, we'll come back and we'll mention, uh, or we'll talk about three tickers that uh, John has on his radar. The Direction Hydrogen ETF offers exposure to the top 30 pure play hydrogen economy companies by largest market capitalization, leading the way towards net zero emissions by providing more accessible, efficient, sustainable solutions across five hydrogen related sub themes. With clean hydrogen based energy expected to grow five times in the next 30 years, companies building hydrogen related businesses to generate power, heating, transportation, and more will likely thrive. Okay, welcome back to the Investing with IBD podcast. I'm your host, Scott St. Clair, filling in for Justin Nielsen this week, uh, along with Arush Pires. And our guest is John Boyk, who's a market historian and an author. And um, let's go ahead and get into uh, some stocks that he's watching the leadership of the current cycle. Arusha, why don't you... Uh, Pull up the very first stock. Should we start with NVIDIA yeah. or end with NVIDIA? Yeah, we might as well start with NVIDIA because <laughs> because the leading right in. I, I should say that I do own shares of NVIDIA uh, just for compliance. But Me John, as well. All of us. Everybody. Everybody um, has. A and I'm sure a number of listeners out there, too. Yeah. But uh, so, yeah. So, John, why don't you walk, walk through NVIDIA and, and tell us what you like about it? Well, here's one thing, though, that's interesting about NVIDIA. Most new uptrends are led by some new names, right? Yeah. Exactly. NVIDIA has been there several times, but that's also not unusual because they're reinventing themselves all the time. So this new uptrend from NVIDIA, and you got an all-time high now, is because they're saying we're in AI and we're going to do this and we're going to do these chips and everything and we're going to be the leader of that. So you can go back to to uh, Google and Apple back in the day. Apple, re how many times did Apple reinvent themselves? They did the, the Mac, then they did iTunes, they did I the iPod, they had the iPhone, iWatch. I mean, you can have repeatable leaders. If we go way back to, I'm, I, I'm getting off track again, but I, I wanna mention this. So Chrysler was such a leader. O'Neill nailed that thing in 62 off the, mock, the bottom in October. The same day, Jared Lowe bought it, and so did Bernard Baruch, three of the greatest truck stock traders of all time, nailed that same stock on the same day, okay? But Chrysler had led – Jared Lowe made so much money on Chrysler in so many other periods. So back to NVIDIA. It's, it's an older name, but it's reinventing itself in what could be the next big thing, and that's why it's a leader. So, yeah, look at that base, that big down – and then from the beginning of the year, it's almost straight up through the top. Wow. And then they had earnings that just blew everybody out of the water. And here it goes. There's your, there's your T and there's your true market leader right now today. I mean, you can't argue with that. Yeah. I mean, and really this action is just almost picture perfect, especially after the breakout. So it did form a stage one cup. And then ever since then, it's just been slowly crawling up putting in three weeks tight patterns here. And of course, then the, the, the massive gap, um, after they just blew away uh, their earnings and, and doubled their revenue estimates. Um, and then also they formed put another three weeks tight after that. So uh, just picture perfect action. There, there is big money coming into that stock. I mean, has, I mean it's, that's what you get with your leader. Yeah, and I think it's it's key to also say that now it is extended, right? So yeah, super the, extended. Exactly. So you, yeah, those listening out there, you know, you don't want to be rushing into uh, getting NVIDIA right now. 
put it on the watch list, let it set up again. It might be a few weeks from now. It might be a couple of months from now. Who knows? It might be, you know, next week. But uh, you have to be patient. You have to be disciplined. You don't want to rush into it because all you have to do is look at 2022. NVIDIA actually it dropped, you know, yes. uh, 50%. So yeah. these stocks are only good when they go up. But the market was bad during that time. And if the yep. market stays good, this thing could it could it could keep ripping. Great stocks will let you in numerous times. Mm -hmm. okay? That's a good point. So. And hey, look, it's based on history. Let's talk about history. What will NVIDIA do? It'll pull back to the 10-week moving average. It'll build a base. It'll probably do that, uh, <laughs> both of those things, sometimes more than once in its cycle until it finally tops. It's eventually, it will top, of course. But yeah, so if you don't own it, you, you, you're looking for either a pullback if you're that type of trader or if you prefer a base, it will build a base. It, 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 history said so. It, they, they rinse and repeat uh, on these leading stocks. They just don't go in a straight line. The greatest stocks all come back to the 21 day and bounce off of that. Those are the, the elite stocks don't even yeah. come back to the 50. So the best of the best keep bouncing off that a lot of traders use that these days keep and it, there's so many I, monster stock lessons had so many of those they didn't even go to the 50 yet they just until the uptrend ended or their run ended there were numerous times to get in off of 21 day and i'm going to talk about that in this next stock we talk about cool yeah. so for reference the i don't know if you have that on the chart or issue but the 21 day for uh, currently is uh, for nvidia today is wednesday june 21st is uh 387 and change yeah, so, so it's 10 percent yeah, more yeah so but ideally they'll they'll converge and so yes. maybe you'll get a uh, you'll get a spot at 395 you know 10 days yeah. 10 trading days from now or something like right, that right uh the next one john i'm sorry what's the next ticker you want to go to let's do um super micro because it's kind of in the same they partnered with nvidia they're kind of the hardware guy for the do and the ai stuff and Mm -hmm. This thing just, look at that. It just ripped off of that. It got support. I can't see that. It's, it was 50, and then it kind of pulled back in and out, and then there was a short report on it, and everybody just ignored that. It pulled it back down and then just took off. Right. Now, that's one I'm watching very closely because today, the last three, four days, it's just slid back. It's kind of hanging on its 21-day line mm -hmm. and if this is a real leader it could find support there or it could go to the 50 day but this is a major leading stock look at that jump and look at the volume so i mean it, it's just this is the classic form that has happened over and over again so it's a leading stock and, and it's in that ai area again so there you go that's another one you know, you know what's interesting about this one, re really through, I mean, I, and at the end of 2022, but a through a lot of uh, the beginning part of 2023, this is what I would call a, a, a bucking bronco, where it was yeah. always seems to be the one first in the new highs, and then it would shake out everybody, and then just rip higher again, and then shake everyone out again. Yeah. Uh, okay. and, and and so it's yeah, and so it's honestly it's not necessarily surprising to see it run up this much, but it's also uh, not surprising to hear that. I mean, there are I know some people have it, but not a lot of people versus like an Nvidia or so, some of the other stocks. Yeah, but look how that's hung in during the bear. Yeah, exactly. there's your example of what's the next new leader? The ones that decline the most during a bear market that they just came out of. Mm -hmm. So this is a very interesting stock. Um, I have some of it and I'm watching. I want more. So um, if it if it continues, I mean, if it breaks, yeah. I'm gone. I don't, I mean, you know, I'm not going to hang around, but um, <laughs> it's very interesting. Um, you can't argue with that, that price and volume action there. Uh, all right, so let's uh, go to the next one, which is uh, it's not AI, unfortunately. We're gonna give them. We'll, we'll give it, it them something. Might power those who program <laughs> AI, those guys. Yeah, and that's uh, Celsius, right? Ticker is C E L H. Yeah, um, this one had a big uptrend there, and then it pulled back and it broke some lines, and I was in it, and then I got out of it during that downtrend thing. 
thing and it's it's come back to life and it's got some strong fundamentals and it's good to see that it's not AI related. It's good to see more breath in the market from some broader categories. And I don't use their product, but a lot of my Twitter guys do it and they swear by it. It's kind of a competitor to monster energy from Hanson and whatever. Um, but you can't argue with the fundamentals. They have a deal with Pepsi right now. So, um, I mean, look at this and it's, it's hanging in there. It's, it's ripped higher. And then it's this pullback is kind of just hanging around. So there now I've heard there's a lot of short interest in this stock. So we'll see what happens with that one. But, um, that's another one. It's a leader. Look at it. The price is telling you I'm a leader. Look at me. So. You know, what's interesting, John, is that for a number of stocks, especially when you are potentially coming out of a bear market and going into a bull market, a lot of the best stocks or a lot of the stocks that are going to come up on our radar and some of the ones that we're going to try, they are going to be heavily shorted, right? Because people are, yeah. are just still in the bear mode. They're betting against the, the ones that are breaking out into new highs. They don't understand the stories. And they don't realize how far or how far and how fast and how quickly some of these things can run. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, Scott, I don't know if you have you ever tried one of these Celsius uh, uh, drinks? I think so. I, I, I'm pretty certain I have. Yeah. I wasn't a big fan, if I recall. Yeah. Um, but I think I'm wrong as, as, as based on the stock <laughs> chart that sometimes it hurts you, right? They say, it's, get to know the companies you're buying and then you, you get to know it and you're like, yeah, that's not that exciting. The stock goes up fivefold without you. you know? <laughs> can <laughs> so I add one? Can don't I add do one too more? much research? Yeah, go ahead, John. I'm sorry. Just, just this is interesting. So put up a uh, AEHR. So um, Arusha back in November, you said name some stocks. This was one of them that I named back in November. And I said, this kind of looks really good. Mm -hmm. And then the, the bear market continued on and it's saying, and look at it fall apart over there. So I was out of that, but it had a good run up until that point. This thing has come back to life. Yeah. I mean, this is showing you, it's like, Oh, I'm a leader again. And I'm coming back to life. It made a new high just, I think last week. So yeah. Um, I, that's just an interesting story because we talked about this one in November and then it kind of left and now it's come back with the market in a stronger, um, you know, stronger health situation. So. Yeah, I almost want to say that this, th this is a bucking Bronco that bucks the other Bronco off. Um, th th this <laughs> one, this one is insanely, there's like, I can, there are some charts you can look at and you, you know, you know, immediately that you have no chance. And when I look at this one, I was like, yes, it's gone on a great run. But there is no way I, I could survive the volatility in this. One. <laughs> okay, they're tempting because volatility cuts both ways, right? You, if you yeah. dig, it, it, there's volatility to the upside. So, it, I've been in AEHR, and, and I have to admit it, it it was not an easy one to hold. So, um, I, I didn't capture hardly any of the move, unfortunately. But yeah, well, you almost I, have to do the opposite, right? Where you're not buying strength, you're buying weakness on this. I like. There was supporters. a guy that was buying AHR. He says it's on the 200 day. I, I think AHR is a, a, a buy on, on IBD live. And, oh, there you go. And uh, wow, yeah, I know. And I hope he bought it. I hope he held it. That's exactly, <laughs> that's exactly what happened. It bounced right off the 200. Yeah. Day. yeah it held perfectly. And I All wasn't right. paying attention, but I, you know, my yeah, problem. that's the problem. And that's, it's actually kind of a good problem because there's a, there's a lot out there and there's stuff to, um, you know, that, that, to, that you were, you know, concentrated and, you know, this is a whole nother podcast, but if you, if you just need to own five, 10, 12 stocks, you know, you can't yeah. own them all. You can't kiss all the babies, right, John? Like yeah. Bill would say. Yeah. yeah, that's right. All right. Well, John, thank you very much for joining us. So uh, we talked about the markets. It's, it's been uh, a really good market, it's a bit extended probably, but the breadth is improving study history there are a million books out there based on history and john has uh three or four of the million uh i've got two of them on my even, desk here yeah i, I, I have well i have all i think all of them i have I legendary I have traders i must have loaned that to somebody and never got it back which is one of the uh the downsides to having a lot of books is it's 
it's easy to see when it's not easy to notice when one is missing. So right. <laughs> I love your books, John. It's been a pleasure Thank having you. you on the show. How, how can uh, people keep in touch with you? What do you have going on? Anything that, that, that uh, you're doing, what's the best way for, um, for people to, uh, to follow you, so to speak? Yeah, I'm, I'm only on Twitter. Um, the, the handle is at monster stocks, one, the number one. So you can see what I'm up to over there. Um, and I'm on there all the time. I'm on Twitter pretty good. I've only been there a few years, um, but uh, I like doing it. And I post a lot of history stuff on there. So you can see what I'm up to recently um, if you go to that Twitter account. Right. And I definitely follow you and I'm sure Arusha does. So Absolutely, I would definitely, yeah. definitely follow me. It's at Monster Stocks, the number one. Correct, yes. John? Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. So that'll do it for this week. Thanks for joining us, John. Next week, uh, IBD's Ken Shreve will take over my spot as guest host for Justin because I'll be on vacation. So uh, <laughs> wait, wait, wait. That, did, I, did I draw the short end of the stick or something here? Yeah, it's that time of year. A lot of vacations uh, going on. So I'm sure we'll have another great episode. Thank you for turning, tuning in. And um, thanks, Arusha. It's always fun to do the podcast. We will see you guys uh, next week. Make sure to subscribe, rate, and review our podcast if you haven't already. We'd really appreciate it. You can also send us your questions and comments to investingpodcast at investors.com. We would love to hear from you and may use your comments on an upcoming episode. This podcast is for informational and educational purposes only, and nothing should be construed as a recommendation to buy, hold, or sell any securities. Make sure to consider consulting with your financial advisor before making any investment decisions.